Hello again and welcome back. I'm back today with another school shooting. This one is one that I hadn't been familiar with, and it was certainly an interesting one to read up on. This case was one where information varied widely between different witness accounts. So as always, I did my best to weed out the inaccurate information, but something may have slipped in. If you are aware of either an incorrect detail or something important I left out, please leave it in the comments, and I will pin it if I'm able to verify it. Thank you for joining me for another video, and without further ado, let's get right into it. It was a calm morning like any other on Friday, October 24th, 2014 in Marysville, Washington. That was until a frightening text was received by the members of the Freiburg family. At 10.37 a.m. that day, the relatives of 15-year-old Jalen Freiburg received a worrying text from him. The text message consisted of Jalen explaining the specific desires he had for his funeral arrangements, such as what he would like to be wearing in his casket. He also went on to request that his family apologize to all of the friends and family who were going to quote, get caught in this shit tomorrow. It was only minutes later when Jalen carried out a horrific attack on a group of his closest friends. Let's back up and talk about Jalen for a moment. Jalen Ray Freiberg was born on July 31, 1999. He lived with his family on the Tulalip Indian Reservation in Marysville, Washington, where he was being raised to become a future leader on the reservation, according to fellow tribe member John McCoy. John stated, quote, A lot of folks were considering that he would move up the culture ranks and become a leader. He had that kind of charisma and raw talent. Jalen's huge family was well known around the reservation. His grandfather was part of the tribal council and was even the director of cultural and natural resources for the tribe while his grandma was the general manager of tribal government operations. His parents were also involved in the community. It was no surprise that Jalen himself would likely move up in the tribe. He loved to learn more about his Native American roots and expressed a lot of interest in one day becoming a leader. He also was diabetic, not that it's super important to the case, but it kind of comes up later. According to most that knew Jalen, he was an all around outgoing and friendly guy. He was athletic and was part of his school's football team. He was also into wrestling. However, I'm not sure if he participated in this sport at the time of this case. Jalen also loved the outdoors and was big into hunting and fishing. I wasn't able to find much about his upbringing, so I'm assuming it was normal for the most part. In seventh grade, Jalen met a girl named Shailene, who soon became his long-term girlfriend. They had their ups and downs like any normal couple, but their relationship sustained for quite a while. Fast forward a few years, and Jalen was now 15 years old and in ninth grade, attending Marysville Pilchuck High School. By all accounts, he had many friends at school, and was even considered to be popular among the students. That brings us to the setting of today's case. So now let's dive a bit deeper into the days leading up to his attack. According to Jalen's football coach, John Mills, Jalen and another student had been having problems with one another during football practice. And this was a recurring thing. Jalen and this unnamed student did not get along very well, and soon things would escalate. The student would ultimately end up using racial epithets against Jalen. According to my sources, this student was not only picking on Jalen at the time, but he's said to have been regularly using racist insults on other students as well. On October 13th, 2014, after another back and forth argument between Jalen and the unnamed student during football practice, their coach separated the two and had a talk with Jalen's father and planned to talk with the unknown student the next day. The next day rolls around and before Coach Mills could speak with the other student, he and Jalen got into another altercation. But this time, it wasn't just verbal. It escalated into a physical fight, which consisted of Jalen beating up the student. When Coach Mills questioned Jalen as to what happened, he stated, quote, I beat the crap out of him. Jalen and this other student were subsequently suspended for the rest of the week as a result of the fight. Despite being suspended from school that week, Jalen would attend homecoming on that Friday, October 17th, 
where he was recorded being crowned homecoming prince. In the video, Jalen was visually calm, often keeping his head down, and it seemed as if nothing was wrong. Jalen's girlfriend Shailene did not attend the same school as Jalen, but she was accompanying him to the homecoming dance at his school. According to police reports, one of Jalen's cousins named Nate later stated that sometime during the night everyone went back to Jalen's house to hang out. Eventually, the only ones that remained were Jalen himself, Shailene, and an unnamed girl. At some point, Shailene caught Jalen laying in bed with the girl. Jalen told Shailene to leave and that he didn't want to be with her anymore. Apparently, Jalen told Shailene that he liked this other girl and that they were going to start something new together. This caused Shailene to freak out and storm out of the house. According to official police reports, conversations between Jalen and the other girl started sometime days prior, on the 15th. It was clear to investigators that they had started a relationship around this time. Despite their great efforts to keep the relationship hidden, it obviously came to light. His cousin Nate then recalled that Jalen and this other girl ended up doing, quote, stuff that night. Nate stated that Jalen expressed regret about his actions the next day and wanted to get back with Shailene. She would not talk to him. Since Jalen and Shailene didn't attend the same school, a lot of their communication was through text. The text conversation between the two on October 19th goes as follows according to official police reports. At 3 a.m., Shailene wrote, I hate you. A few minutes later, she sent him, quote, Fuck you, Jalen. I hate you so much. Jalen responds, quote, This is your fault, not mine. On the 20th, Jalen texted Shailene at 12.37 p.m. saying, quote, Are you really telling people that blank ruined our relationship? With no response, a few minutes later, he sent, Huh? At 1 p.m. he sent, quote, Just talk to me real quick. Is that really what you're telling people? Because I'm not at school, but people at my school are asking me what's going on and asking how blank messed things up. Might as well get your story straight and tell everyone you're a psycho. Tell everyone that you tried choking me and threw some punches. Because that's really why I broke up with you. He continues, quote, I would have been fine staying with you, but you just went crazy. So please, if you're going to talk shit, get your story straight and tell the truth. Don't try to make this all mine or Blank's fault, it's yours. I'll post this shit on Facebook if you want, cause you're really making me mad. I was gonna leave you alone and not have a single word come out of my mouth about you. You should do the same, so please, I'd like to just not hear my name coming out of your mouth. The text message goes on, quote, not trying to be rude, but this is bullshit that you are telling people some different shit. I was gonna let your shit slide, until you assumed me and Blank were doing something because we were laying close to each other, and then you went psycho. That's when I decided I was done. So get your shit straight. Bye. Shailene still did not respond, which prompted Jalen to send a series of more messages to her. At 1.09 p.m., he wrote, quote, All right, whatever. I won't talk to you. I just hope you tell the damn truth from now on. A few hours later, at 4 p.m. on the same day, he sent, quote, All right, can we talk? I bet right now you're at the point where you're like, fuck him, I don't want nothing to do with him, and I get that, but can we talk real quick? Then he wrote, quote, I don't want to talk about getting back together, if that's what you're thinking. And I bet you're talking to someone, so I'll just leave that be. Nine minutes later, Jalen sent another message, quote, just tell me you don't want to talk. Damn, don't just hit me with that no response shit. Shailene still hasn't responded to his messages at this point, so he's pretty much just spewing to get her attention. Later in the day, at around 9 p.m., Jalen sent, quote, okay, why'd you tell everyone me and Blank were fucking and walked in on us? He goes on to ask, quote, no, for real, why? Into the early hours of the next day, Jalen continued his messaging to Shailene. At 1.12 a.m., he wrote, quote, just please talk me out of this, the gun's in my hand, please. About five hours later, Shailene finally responded saying, quote, Jay. He then responded with, what? It wouldn't be until hours later at 9.21 a.m. when Shailene responded saying, quote, yeah, 
Don't text me ever. Don't call me in the middle of the night and say all this bullshit, and then tell me you're letting me go the next day. So fucked up. Do not ever talk to me. Don't text me at all, I can't believe you. I'm done forever. Don't miss me, don't want me back. Ever. Because I'm done. Nine minutes later, she sent another text saying, quote, I hope you understand that you are never getting me back, and I'm not gonna be here for you any longer. I'm out. All the way out. Done. I'm never believing anything you fucking say. You've done enough damage, and I would appreciate if you just left me alone. Good job, Jay. And thank you for making this a lot easier for me. Have a good life. Two minutes later, at 9.32 a.m., Jalen responded with, quote, I'm done hurting you. All the times I hurt you. You know I didn't mean to. You know it. So please just stop. Just talk to me, please. Shailene responded almost immediately, saying, quote, No, you stop. Stop hurting me. Stop hurting me over and over and over and over. Just fucking stop. An argument ensued, but it was just a bunch of rambling that isn't super important. At 7.37 p.m., after they had been fighting and Shailene had ignored him even more, Jalen wrote, quote, And no one will make you feel the way I make you feel. No one. I love you so damn much it's crazy. And it's gonna kill us to see each other with other people. And I'll tell you right now. I will, but I won't care that you and Blank are together. And when I see him, he's still gonna get his for what he did. What my bro said he wouldn't do. He will die. Then you'll see he ain't shit. I'm sorry for everything. I really am. I love you though. I really do. More than anyone in the damn world. And I will. Forever and ever. The argument continued and ended with Jalen saying, quote, Okay, well don't bother coming to my funeral. He later said to her, quote, Okay, good. I will kill him. There's not much context, so I'm not sure what prompted this message. The names are redacted in the texts, so it isn't clear who he's talking about. However, the fact that he called him bro makes me think he was talking about someone he was very good friends with, possibly even his cousin Andrew. Take that with a grain of salt, though, as it's not clear. I'll explain why I think that in a bit. The next day, Jalen went on to send multiple messages to Shailene with no response. He ultimately ended up sending her a message that said, quote, I set the date. Hopefully you regret not talking to me. You have no idea what I'm talking about, but you will. Bang, bang. I'm dead. The next day, October 23rd, Jalen sent another string of messages throughout the day. They read, quote, Meet me by the cafeteria after school so I can say bye. Gonna need to call you at some point, and I hope you fucking answer. Hope you read my messages tomorrow. Love you. I need you to read all of my texts tomorrow. Can you do that? At 9.17 a.m., Jalen made his last tweet, which read, quote, It won't last. It'll never last. Finally, the morning of October 24th rolled around, and the messages from Jalen to Shailene continued. They read, quote, Morning. This saddens me. Then he sent an unknown picture with the caption, God damn, so fucked. He continued sending the texts, quote, Just please read my messages today, okay? Please, thank you. His last message to her phone was sent at 6, 65 a.m. She didn't respond to any of them. Communication between Jalen and Shailene ceased when she finally blocked his number, but Jalen was not happy with that. Instead, he began to go through her cousin to reach her. The two had obviously been having major problems recently, not only surrounding the supposed events of homecoming night. I read that Jalen's cousin Andrew was possibly involved. It isn't blatantly obvious what exactly was going on, but some of Jalen's tweets around this time seem to point to the fact that Andrew may have been flirting with either his ex-girlfriend Shailene, or another girl that Jalen may have been with or had a crush on, possibly the one from homecoming. None of the tweets mention Andrew by name but the vast majority of sources I came across point Andrew out as being the source of tension, which was the rumor around school. One of the tweets read, Did you forget she was my girlfriend? Another said, Dude, she tells me everything, and now, I fucking hate you. You're no longer my brother. Jalen and his cousin Andrew were incredibly close. They often referred to each other as brothers due to their close bond. This is what makes me think he was talking about Andrew in the earlier text messages. If Andrew was indeed doing what most sources claim, it would have broken Jalen, considering their relationship was so tight. Again, as far as I gathered, there is no concrete evidence to suggest this, other than maybe the texts which are redacted, but it's a widely circulated rumor. 
Also, according to his cousin Nate, in the days following the homecoming dance, Jalen was continually posting on Snapchat. When asked about the specifics of the posts, Nate recalled that they were mostly about his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend, and Jalen was saying stupid stuff, like how he may as well just die. Nate reached out to Jalen to make sure he was okay, and his response was, quote, Yeah bro, everything's fine. Jalen was also making some unsettling posts to his Twitter account. They surely lend an idea as to how he was feeling during this time. However, Nate claims that the posts to his Snapchat account were worse. His Twitter feed, at least, was relatively normal until mid-June. On June 18th, 2014, he made a series of posts to Twitter. I'm not going to list every single one, just ones that seem relevant. Those read, quote, Don't talk to you, okay. That's what I was doing last night. Wasn't that hard? You're starting to piss me off. You're so fucking brave. Just remember, this is fucking it. No more after this. The next day, June 19th, he made a tweet, quote, I guess this is really it. Then on the 20th, he posted, quote, fuck it, might as well die now. Skip a chunk of time. And on August 20th, he posted, quote, you're gonna piss me off, and then some shit's gonna go down, and I don't think you'll like it. You're not gonna like what happens next. I hate that I can't live without you. It was during the end of September when he made the tweets that seemed to be referring to problems involving his girlfriend. On October 20th, Jalen posted, quote, All right, you fucking got me. That broke me. The next day he made a series of tweets, quote, It breaks me. It actually does. I know it seems like I'm sweating it off, but I'm not, and I never will be able to. I should have listened. You were right. The whole time you were right. That's pretty much it prior to the shooting, so let's move on. According to a later interview with Jalen's parents, Raymond and Wendy, the events of the morning of October 24th, 2014, goes as follows. Raymond went to work as normal, and Wendy drove Jalen to school. On the way, they picked up Wendy's niece and took her to school as well. According to Jalen's mom, the ride was uneventful. She dropped the two teens off at around 7.30 a.m., Neither of Jalen's parents had any contact with him until around three hours later, when they received a text from him that I'll go over in a minute. On the morning of October 24, 2014, only minutes before the shooting began, Jalen sent Shailene's cousin a photo on Facebook of a firearm sitting between his legs. Along with the photo, Jalen wrote, quote, Have Shailene call me before I do this. Some sources report that she did end up calling him and they spoke for a few minutes but others state that she only tried calling him after she found out the deadly incident occurred. So I'm not exactly sure which is true. If she did call him, I was never able to find out what was said during the call. Either way, at 10.38 a.m., Shailene would decide to text Jalen's phone after hearing about this worrying message from her cousin. She states, quote, Your number is blocked. Leave me the fuck alone, and I will be texting Dad and letting him know about your whole killing yourself situation. Unfortunately, Shailene was too late and would never receive a response from Jalen. Jalen had been texting his friend group throughout that morning, telling them to meet him in the school's cafeteria for lunch. I saw that after a bit of resistance from some friends, Jalen urged them to skip their classes to hang out with him. The group consisted of Jalen's two cousins, 15-year-old Andrew Freiberg and 14-year-old Nate Hatch, and his friends, 14-year-old Zoe Galasso, 14-year-old Gia Soriano, and 14-year-old Shaylee Chuckle Nasket. Also, at the table was another of Jalen's cousins, Karen Parks, and another friend of his, Carmen Lopez. There was supposed to be another person joining them, but fortunately they decided not to skip their class. At 10.37 a.m., Jalen sent a text to his dad which read, quote, read the note on my bed, dad, I love you. A couple seconds later, Jalen sent that text message to his many family members that I spoke about in the beginning of the video. I'm going to apologize now for the amount of information that was redacted in the text, as it will sound a little funny, but you'll be able to get the gist of it. The entire text reads, quote, My funeral shit. My 270 win goes to blank and blank, referring to his 270 Winchester rifle. My 17 HMR goes to blank, referring to another rifle. I want to be fully dressed in camo in my casket. Brand new, expensive as shit camo. I don't want my family to cancel their trip in December. 
Tell Blank that I love her with all my heart if I don't call her. I'm assuming he's talking about Shailene here, but I wasn't able to verify that for certain, so I kept the redactions. Anyway, the text continues. Quote, My dog's name has to be Blank, because Blank name is Blank. That's why I picked it. I know my parents thought it's because that's where she was from, but it's not. I want my freshman team to play their fucking asses off next Wednesday. Tell Blank he'll always be my bro. Always. Put my hat with the S on it on me in my casket. Put an insulin bag in my casket with me and burn one for me. I want mine, Andrew's, and Blank's graves to all be lined up. Apologize to Blank's parents and tell them that I didn't want to go alone. And who would be better to go with than the one and only Blank? Make sure that all of my trust money or whatever all goes to my brother Blank. My password to my phone is 4526, stands for I love Blank. Also apologize to Andrew's fam and Blank's fam for me taking them with me. But I needed my ride or dies with me on the other side. And all of my other friends if they get caught in this shit tomorrow. Zoe Galasso, Blank, Gia Soriano, Blank, and Shaley Chuckle Nasket. And I don't know. They'll all be lying next to each other. Once again, tell Blank I love her with all my fucking heart. Please ask Blank to not be with Blank at all. That is my last dying wish. To my parents, give Blank all your attention. Don't you dare tell him no. If he doesn't want to go to school, let him stay home. Just don't tell him no. I love all of my family. I hope you all know that. Tell Blank not to be with Blank. Tell her my last wish is for her not to talk to him at all, and not to be with him. Parts of this text are a bit confusing. If Jalen was indeed having issues with his cousin Andrew, he didn't seem to mention anything about it here. Jalen then went on to list the songs he wanted played at the funeral, writing, quote, It needs to be poppin'. Play the Randy Wood and the Kevin Yazzie first and play the poppin' shit next, and ask Blank for some poppin' shit to play. The text continues, quote, Make sure everyone's family goes to Graham's for a dinner. I need you guys to make that happen. It needs to happen. I need you guys to invite everyone's parents over to Graham's for a big dinner. You guys need to cook all that deer meat Graham canned and the meat that's in the downstairs freezer at our house. The text concludes with, quote, I love you family. I really do, more than anything. Tell Blank the same. I needed to do this though. I wasn't happy. And I need my crew with me too. I'm sorry. I love you. Two minutes after Freiburg sent the text out to his family members, he executed his fatal plan. At this time, his family members were frantically trying to get a hold of him following his disturbing text. When the group was finally together, the events vary from person to person. I've read that Freiburg confronted his cousin Andrew about the issues that had been happening between them recently, and the two got into a bit of an argument. However, someone who was sitting nearby recalled hearing Freiburg ask one of the girls out, who declined, which ultimately sent him over the edge. Whatever the exact situation may be, it seems that most recounts name a conflict of some sort as the reason Freiburg began the attack. It's possible that no matter what happened between the group that day, it would have led to the same result as it's clear Freiburg had been planning to do something sinister for a while. It's important to note that despite these claims, Nate, who was sitting at the table, later recalled that there was no fight between anyone prior to the shooting. He stated that Jalen simply began the attack completely unprovoked. I'm not sure how different accounts can vary this much, but I'm sure the cafeteria was loud at the time, which could have contributed to surrounding students mishearing what was said between the group. Memories are also wild when it comes to recalling information about traumatic events. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the bystanders thought they heard something that never happened. Jalen proceeded to dig around in his backpack. He pulled out a Beretta PX4 Storm, and then stood up and began to fire it at all of his surrounding friends. Based on police reports, I did my best to recreate the shooting in this animated footage. Please let me know if this is something you guys would like to see more often. Anyway, Jalen proceeded to shoot almost everyone in the head one by one, moving clockwise around the table. He attempted to shoot all seven friends, but only ended up hitting five of them. According to official police reports, the seating positions of his friends goes as follows. From Jalen, moving clockwise was Shaylee, Zoe, Andrew, Nate, and then Gia. Karen and Carmen were seated to his right, in which order I am not completely sure. Zoe Galasso was unfortunately killed instantly, 
while the other four were critically injured. Thankfully, Karen and Carmen were both uninjured. Karen immediately ran away from the table, while Carmen instinctively dropped to the ground before fleeing. All hell broke loose in the cafeteria. Students were screaming and running in every direction, attempting to flee from the terrifying scene. Some students were hunkered down in classrooms, too scared to leave in fear they may encounter the shooter. Others were running out of the building, seeking shelter in nearby fenced yards and buildings. A teacher that was nearby, Megan Silberberger, saw as Freiburg shot his friends and immediately rushed to stop the gunman. Despite the horrifying situation, she decided to run towards the danger and risk her life to hopefully save others. At this time, she was only a first-year teacher at the school. Jalen then proceeded to reload his gun, and before Miss Silberberger reached him, he turned the gun on himself and shot himself in the head or neck, depending on the source, ending his own life. The following clip is Miss Silberberger's 911 call, which went out immediately after Jalen's death. 911, we have a shooting Marysville Piltrock High School cafeteria. We have the shooter. We have many injured Marysville Piltrock High School. We need emergency right away. Cafeteria, large cafeteria. My name is Megan Silberberger. I'm a teacher. Okay, Megan Silberberger, like can you still hear me? We already had the fire Hi, department honey. and the police department en route. Okay. I've been advised I am how in many the cafeteria. Subjects. I have the shooter. One shooter. Blood is everywhere. I do not see the gun. We I have this down. The shooter. I'm looking at him. Is he a white? Me. I need help. What? I need help now. Shooter right here. He is the brain all black. I'm staring at him right now, sitting next to him. Give me I a need staff now. Him, shooter right here. Black pants, black shoes, black pants, black shoes, black jacket. He is laying on other students. I need a white male, black male, Hispanic male. Uh, Hispanic male. Hispanic male. He is a a high school student. I do not know how old he is. I tried to stop him before he shot himself. I do not know his name. Okay, you said he has shot himself? He shot himself. When first responders arrived, they pronounced Zoe Goloso dead on the scene, but the other four gunshot victims were alive and taken to nearby hospitals for immediate treatment. Jalen's family quickly showed up to the school, worried over the texts they received. They weren't aware that he had already killed himself. At least two of the victims' head injuries were so severe that they were not immediately identifiable. Investigators had to get with the families of the victims in order to gather details such as birthmarks and the clothing they were wearing in order to get a positive identity on them. Unfortunately, despite the hospital's efforts, three of the four injured victims did not survive. 14-year-old Gia Soriano passed away two days after the shooting, on October 26, 2014. Five days after that, on October 31, 2014, 14-year-old Shaley Chuckle-Nasket passed away. And finally, two weeks after the shooting, 15-year-old Andrew Freiberg passed away. 14-year-old Nate Hatch was the only victim to survive his injuries. He had been shot in the face, the bullet shattering his jaw. Apparently, the bullet had ricocheted and landed in his chest. Thankfully, it hadn't done enough damage to kill him. He was in the hospital for a while listed in serious condition, however. Thankfully, after they were able to repair his destroyed jaw, Nate recovered fully from his injuries. Nate later posted on his social media, quote, I love you and I forgive you, Jalen. Rest in peace. According to official reports, in a later interview, Carmen Lopez, who was also at the table that day but uninjured, claimed that she and Jalen had begun dating very recently. If the rumor about Andrew flirting with someone Jalen was involved with is true, it's possible it was Carmen that they were talking about. It also seems that Carmen was the other girl that Jalen was messing around with at and after homecoming. The girl's name was redacted from the report, but the additional information listed in the report makes it likely she was the one Nate was talking about. Of course, we don't know for sure, but at least to me, that's what it seems like. Carmen also said that she had spoken with Jalen earlier the day of the shooting and recalled that he seemed completely normal. Not only that, but apparently Jalen had been over to her house the last two days, and absolutely nothing seemed to be wrong with him. When his fellow students and teachers took a look back at the days leading up to the shooting, 
Some of them recalled Jalen acting a little strange. According to many of the people around him, Jalen had begun to skip classes a few days before he carried out his attack. He also seemed to generally be disinterested in his schoolwork, opting to listen to music in class instead. Apparently, on the morning of the shooting, Jalen was observed as he kept his head on his desk for the duration of one of his classes. But there are also many students who claimed he was acting completely normal, even on the morning of the shooting. Some said that they did not notice a drastic change in his personality, and they had no idea that anything was going on. Authorities interviewed several students that were in the cafeteria during the shooting. One boy said that he was sitting at a nearby table when he heard the shots ring out. He looked over and saw Jalen shoot someone who he didn't recognize in the head. The student then immediately dove to the floor in order to protect himself. Another student that police talked to said that he was good friends with Jalen, and he had actually talked to him during a class they shared earlier that day. This student stated that Jalen seemed more depressed than usual, keeping his head down most of the class. But there was nothing he did or said that gave any indication about what he had planned for later that day. This student was also in the cafeteria at the time, and watched as Jalen shot his friends before fleeing. Many of the witnesses that were interviewed claimed that Jalen had shot his friends and relatives in a calm and methodical way. One in particular recalls Jalen's face having a completely blank expression as he shot the victims. There were so many interviews that it would be impossible to include them all, but I definitely wanted to add a few in. It was later discovered that almost immediately after the shooting, Jalen's family attempted to log into his social media accounts to start deleting his recent posts. This information comes from the police report, and as far as I found, they were unable to gain access to the accounts. Anyway, police obviously wanted to talk with Jalen's parents following the incident. When Jalen's father was asked where he may have gotten the gun from, Raymond stated that he kept a Beretta PX4, along with an extra magazine in the center console of his truck, but was unsure if it was missing. According to him, Jalen would have likely grabbed this gun out of all of the ones he owned. If you'll remember, Freiburg texted his father about a note left on his bed just before he began the attack. Well, it turns out that no note was ever recovered. Now this could be because he somehow just didn't leave one, but according to Nate, Freiburg's brother snapchatted him a picture of a long handwritten note they found at the house. Some seem to believe that his family purposely kept the note from authorities, but please come to your own conclusions on that. No one seemed to have seen the warning signs. To us, it is blatantly clear that his mental health was rapidly deteriorating. Considering the texts he was sending, the Snapchats he was sending, and the tweets he was posting, Jalen was clearly going downhill, and fast. It astonishes me how no one in his life saw something like this coming, but I guess hindsight is 2020. In a tragic turn of events, this horrific shooting possibly could have been avoided altogether. Shockingly, a substitute teacher by the name of Rosemary Cooper, who was covering for another teacher the day or so before the attack, was warned by a student that a shooting would occur soon. Apparently, students all over the school were talking about a social media post in which they learned a shooting would take place in the cafeteria at 10 a.m. I was unable to hunt the specific post down, but multiple sources claimed this. What I don't understand, is if everyone was talking about it, why or how would it have been able to take place? I also read that Jalen had sent a text out to a few people talking about killing himself. Anyway, according to Cooper, she told another member of the faculty about this concerning conversation she had with the student. She also apparently left a note for the teacher she was substituting for. But during the investigation, authorities were unable to verify any of that information. They were never able to turn up anyone that was apparently told about the threat. Also, no note was ever reported to have been found. A lawsuit was filed by the families of the victims. Carmen Lopez, one of the survivors, also filed a similar suit. As it turns out, Rosemary Cooper sought out therapy in 2016, and some notes from two therapists were presented during the lawsuit. One stated that Cooper was, quote, feeling guilty that prior to the shooting, a student showed her a text message where the perpetrator had texted, he was going to kill himself, but the student said not to worry, and Cooper did not follow up with staff. Another note from the therapist said that Cooper had mentioned the concerning text to someone, but quote, did not feel she needed to make a report, as she determined that since her students knew about this, so must everyone else. 
Cooper is filled with regret that she did not specifically report what she heard, feeling if she did, there may have been another outcome. I find it extremely shocking that someone in a teaching position would not take a threat like this more seriously. Knowing the outcome could have been much different, and four innocent lives could have been saved by her simply speaking up is gut-wrenching. As far as I gathered, the district settled the lawsuit with the victim's families for $18 million in 2017. Rosemary Cooper wasn't the only adult held accountable for their actions, though. Following the shooting, Jalen's father, Raymond, was arrested and charged with possession of illegal firearms. You see, back in 2002, Raymond had been the subject of a domestic violence protection order, which ultimately forbade him from purchasing or owning a firearm. During the investigation into the shooting, authorities found that Raymond Freiburg had filled out as many as 10 federal forms while purchasing firearms, and not once made it known that he wasn't allowed to possess them. One of the guns purchased illegally was that Beretta PX-4 that Jalen Freiburg would end up using to shoot five and kill four of his closest friends, before killing himself. Apparently, Raymond's lawyers maintained that he was never personally served with the protection order, so he was unaware he was prohibited from purchasing or owning firearms. Despite this, Raymond was convicted on six counts of illegal firearm possession. He was ultimately sentenced to two years in federal prison. It's strange to me how Raymond was able to simply withhold the information, and that was good enough to buy his firearms. Shouldn't there have been a flag on him, so he was physically unable to buy guns? Information like this irks me. So many little things could have been done to hopefully prevent this attack, and it's incredibly frustrating that nothing ended up being done. Now let's move on to the baffling response following the massacre. It's normal for a community to set up memorials for the victims of such a tragic event. What isn't common is that the killer be honored and memorialized alongside his victims. Well, that's exactly what happened in this case. The whole thing is immensely strange to me. It's one thing to simply forgive the shooter, but that's not what happened here. Strangely, the community began to include Jalen in the memorials, many of them posting on social media about how amazing he was. One post reads, quote, Don't you dare speak of Jalen badly. He is loved and will always be loved. He just wasn't in the right state of mind. I love him. Someone else wrote, quote, I can guarantee all the people saying Jalen went to hell didn't know him personally. Some students attending Marysville Pilchuck High School even wore shirts that said Team Jalen on them. Thankfully, the school shut this down and asked students to remove the shirts, as it is extremely disrespectful to the victims and their families to openly honor a killer. As if that wasn't weird enough, people continually defended him as well. I saw that one student posted to social media, quote, to the guy at Walmart who just looked at my shirt and said, I'm sorry you went to school with a psychopath. I'll pray for you. However, despite the school not condoning students wearing the Team Jalen shirts, they did for some reason still include him in the yearbook, along with pictures of him on the football team and at the homecoming dance. Now that may be because they are obligated to for some reason, but it seems a bit weird. There are plenty more instances of people honoring Jalen with memorial posts, but I think you get the gist. One thing I didn't touch on yet is Shailene's response. Hers followed suit with some of the previously mentioned posts. Seven days after the shooting, on October 31st, 2014, Shailene made a tweet saying, quote, I love you, Jalen Ray, with all I have. You will forever be my soulmate. Rest easy, baby boy. About five months later, Shailene made a post that said, quote, Jalen Ray, I love you, and I miss you so much, babe. On the two-year anniversary of the shooting, October 24th, 2016, Shailene posted, quote, Not a day goes by, Jay. You're so fucking beautiful. Fly high, baby. On July 20th, 2017, she tweeted, quote, Why the fuck doesn't anyone realize I'm going to always love Jalen? I will love him for the rest of my damn life. She continued to post about him through the years, but the posts are pretty redundant, so I won't list them all. She eventually had a baby, coincidentally giving her the middle name Jay. I didn't go digging too far into her social media, but from what I gathered, she hasn't posted about Jalen in years, or at least not as frequently. There are so many supportive responses to the tweets which memorialized and honored Jalen. I can totally understand forgiving someone and not letting something tear your life apart. But to me, this whole thing is so bizarre. In my opinion, Jalen Freiburg doesn't deserve any honor in his death. 
He ripped four amazing people from this world and destroyed their families in the process. No matter how amazing or liked he was in his life, none of that matters when you commit an act such as this. His mental health seemed to play a huge part in his actions, but that still does not excuse this type of behavior. It certainly doesn't relieve him of the responsibility of what he did that day. I now want to dedicate the remainder of this video to the four people who should be remembered and cherished. I am so happy to report that unlike many cases, I was able to find a bunch of information on each victim. Zoe Rain Galasso was born on February 22, 2000, and was 14 years old at the time of her death. According to her family, Zoe was extremely loving, not only to her friends and family, but also animals. So much so that her mother believes Zoe may have gone on to become a veterinarian if she had the chance. She enjoyed hanging out with her friends, live music, and going on road trips. She had a bright and happy personality, which everyone who knew her loved. Zoe was athletic, but especially loved playing soccer. She was also artistic according to her family, and loved to create things. Her mom recalls her being a wild prankster with a contagious laugh. Zoe's mother, Michelle, wrote a book called My Rainbow to Keep, about her experience with losing her beloved daughter. I will have it linked in the description if any of you want to check it out. It seems like a very well-written book about grief and how to overcome the loss of a loved one. Zoe will be remembered by all as the funny, happy, spunky, and friendly girl she was. Gia Christine Soriano was also only 14 years old when she passed away. Her birthday was March 31st, 2000. Like Zoe, Gia was a warm and loving soul. Gia took to children and animals of all kinds in particular. In general though, she was incredibly sweet and always bore a delightful demeanor. She was soft-spoken, but definitely not shy, which made people naturally drawn to her. Gia always exuded kindness, no matter who she was around, according to her family. She had a beautiful smile and lended her helping hand to those who needed it. One of her cousins, Gabby, recalled the wonderful memories she shared with Gia. Gia was always known to teach her younger cousin what she knew about growing up. Gia will always be remembered for her unwavering kindness, as well as her bright and delightful personality. She will never be forgotten. Shaley Adele Chuckle Nasket was born on March 26, 2000, and was also 14 years old at the time of her passing. By all accounts, Shaley was extremely outgoing and fun to be around. She had an amazingly confident personality, and was also said to have been silly, persistent, fearless, and forgiving. Shaley was known for taking selfies in all of her family members' phones, which they now cherish to this day. She loved her friends immensely, but her true love was her family. They all shared a very close bond to her and had nothing but incredible things to say about her. Shaley will always be loved and missed by her relatives. She will be remembered as the exceptional, fun, and loving young lady that she was. Andrew Martin Leroy Freiburg was the only 15-year-old victim and was born on August 10, 1999. He was the first-born boy in the immediate family, and his relatives recall that all of the girls would do anything for him. Like the other victims, Andrew is reported to have been incredibly kind. He was protective of his family and friends, and he cared for them deeply. Andrew was extremely athletic, notably participating in football and wrestling. He was big into the outdoors as well, opting to spend a lot of his time hanging out with friends, four-wheeling, or relaxing out on the water. Andrew will never be forgotten, always remembered for his caring and fun personality. I hope that each and every one of the victims is resting well, and I sincerely wish nothing but the best for their friends and family. From what I read about each of them, they were all incredibly special, and in no way whatsoever deserved what happened to them. All four of these wonderful kids had a bright future that they will sadly never be able to experience. It saddens me more than anything to think about their missed opportunities thanks to a selfish and evil person. They are no longer here because someone couldn't stand to be alone. Jalen said it himself in the text. He needed to bring people with him in order to satisfy himself. He was truly a demented human being. I appreciate all of you who stuck around and listened to the entire video. I hope you all learned something new if you have heard of this case before, and I truly hope you have a good rest of your day. See you next time.